evening, everyone. Welcome to the Dr. David Kearney McDonough 2023 Virtual Scholarship Awards. We're going to give it about a minute or so for people to come in, and then we'll get ready to get started. We want to start on time for our panelists and those that are joining. You see the key code there, please feel free to scan with your iPhone or phone the key code. You'll get a donation link to make donations to help support the scholarships for the medical students that we're awarding tonight. We're awarding $15,000 in scholarships. We also make checks payable to the NMA David Kearney McDonough Fund the National Medical Association at 8403 Coldville Road, Suite 820, Silver Springs, Maryland, 20910. Okay, be generous, okay? Invite people. We're gonna place this link up on the NMA ITV website. So uh, we will circulate this link to share with others, uh, with friends, family, corporate industry, people you do business with to uh, help support our scholarship, help support our students, help address healthcare disparities. Okay. Once again, welcome to the 2023 National Medical Association Ophthalmology Dr. David Kearney McDonough Scholarships Award in Ophthalmology and ENT. My name is Dr. Dan LaRoche. I'm a clinical associate professor of ophthalmology, president of Advanced Eye Care of New York, an affiliated with New York Eye and Infirmary of Mount Sinai, New York University, and Island Eye Surgical Center. The National Medical Association is the collective voice of African American physicians and the leading force for parity and justice in medicine and the elimination of healthcare disparities. The National Medical Association is the largest and oldest organization representing African American physicians and their patients in the United States. The NMA is a 501c3. National Professional and Scientific Organization representing the interests of more than 50,000 African American physicians and the patients they serve. The National Medical Association Ophthalmology Section has a long distinguished history in preventing blindness and combating, combating disease of the eye. In the first published history of the NMA Ophthalmology Section, it was recounted that the section was established jointly with otolaryngologists in 1939 when the NMA convened in New York City. Most practicing ophthalmologists did not have practices that were combined with otolaryngology, and as a result, the section was reorganized as the ophthalmology section and the otolaryngology section in 1974 with independent sections and programs. In 1975, for the first time, a credit, CME credit, pre-conventional workshops was presented. Over the years, we have seen our membership grow with the addition of members in subspecialty areas in both private and academic medical practices. We have in our ranks members representing virtually every subspecialty in ophthalmology, department chairs at major teaching institutions, membership on high-level governmental committees, and several college presidents who have distinguished themselves in published ranks of academic medicine and research. Next slide, please. I want to acknowledge Dr. our chair, Dr. Fasica Waretta, who is our section chair. She's a cornea specialist and surgeon at the John Hopkins uh, Medical Center. And so this is her here. We want to thank her for her leadership. Next slide, please. I want to acknowledge the National Medical Association Ophthalmology Executive Committee members, I include Karen Allison, Monique Barber, Nanita Brown, Joseph Coney, Iniolami Dosunemu, Aaron Dodson, Benjo Edgehill, myself, Eden Miller, Mildred Olivier, Clifton Pay, Basil Williams, and Dr. Shelby Wilkes. Next slide, please. These are the founding committee members that started this scholarship several years ago. They're all from New York. They include Dr. Karen Allison, Ann Arthur, Necca Brooks, Jacqueline Busenji, Benjil Edgehill, Rondea Evans, Shanique Jeniton, myself, Dr. John Mitchell, and Dr. Dwayne Rollins. Dr. Rollins was the only ENT person. Everybody else was an ophthalmologist and we're all based in New York. The image you're seeing to the right is a portrait tribute to Dr. David Kearney McDonough that stands at the New York Eye and Infirmary today. It was donated by myself and my wife, Marjorie. And we want to thank Dr. James Sai, who was able to 
accept this donation and they hang it up at the New York Times Infirmary. And I think Dr. Richard Copeland, who graduated from Lafayette College, where Dr. McDonough went and helped to share uh, the legacy of McDonough with myself to help contribute to um, really inspire me to help start this scholarship with the founding committee members. Next slide, please. At this point, I, would, I want to thank also our 2023 committee members, uh, Dr. Karen Allison, Dr. Ann Arthur, Dr. Billy Bisco, Dr. Anita Brown, Dr. Barry Bro Sr., uh, Jacqueline Busenji, Joseph Coney, Benjil Edgehill, Shanique Jenaton, Clifton Pay, and Shelby Wells. At this point, I would like to introduce the next slide, please. Dr. Benjil Edgehill, who's a former chair of the ophthalmology section of the National Medical Association uh, from 2018 to 2020. He's a Brooklyn native who attended Duke University School of Medicine. His former ophthalmology training was done at Sunny Downstate in Brooklyn. He completed his glaucoma and anterior segment fellowship at Duke. He has been a practicing in Staten Island, New York for the past 15 years. Dr. Edgehill has taken care of thousands of patients and is an expert in the latest and medical laser and surgical treatments for glaucoma and cataracts. He's board certified by the American Board of Ophthalmology and a fellow of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. He's a key opinion leader for two of the latest microinvasive uh, surgical devices and treatment of glaucoma, and has given lectures nationally teaching other physicians and participating in symposiums throughout the United States. He also participated in international medical missions, including trips to Ghana and Haiti. So at this point, I'm gonna talk it over to Dr. Benjil Edgehill, who will make a tribute to Dr. David Kearney McDonough. I just wanna share some of the history of Dr. David Kearney McDonough. The reason why we're gathered here tonight, he's an inspiration to all of us, um, whether you know it or not. David McDonough was born into slavery in 1821 on a plantation in New Orleans, Louisiana. John McDonough, was one of the richest men in the South and allowed some of his enslaved men to attend school with the contingency that they buy their freedom and re relocate to Liberia. He was part of the American Colonization Society. As uh, Dr. Roche mentioned, uh, David McDonough went to Lafayette College to pursue his formal education in 1838. But after having some experiences with the locals and becoming uh, a leader in the community, he became determined to pursue his medical education. This, of course, was against John McDonough's wishes for him to relocate to Liberia after purchasing his freedom. But he was so committed to his dream that he found other ways. This led him to become the first Black physician in ophthalmology and otolaryngology in the United States. He was also the first black physician at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary in New York. Although he died in 1893, as you can see, his life was full of firsts. He was the first African-American to graduate from Lafayette College and he graduated number three in his class. To his dismay, he could not attend any medical school legally because none would accept him. But he made enough connections and political contacts that he was able to attend the College of Physicians and Surgeons, even though he would never receive a scholarship from them during his lifetime. Joining uh, with John Kearney Rogers, he was invited to become uh, an attending physician at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. This shows that despite all of the hurdles in his life, he was convinced of his dream and he was committed to being a self-determining black man. So as I mentioned before, when he attended college, he made some connections and became interested in the field of med medicine under the teaching of a local physician, Dr. Hugh H. Abernathy. Even though he expressed his interest to John McDonough, because he was not gonna relocate to Liberia as initially um, agreed upon, he had to break off 
his ties with John McDonough. And this led to a break that was never really repaired. This meant that he had to now find his way in this world without his original benefactor, who was also his slave owner. So it was probably for the best anyway. He made some connections with John Kearney Rogers, as I mentioned earlier, and that allowed him to continue his pursuit of excellence. He concurrently held staff positions upon graduation at the New York Hospital and the INA Infirmary for many years while residing in Newark. And he continued on to become the first African-American ENT and ophthalmology specialist in America. His legacy includes working with Frederick Douglass to help abolish slavery and integrate healthcare. He, uh, in his memory, the McDonough Memorial Hospital was opened on 40, 41st Street in Manhattan, offering medical education and clinical care to men and women of all races. Unfortunately, the hospital closed in 1904 due to lack of funding, but his memory lives on. You can see this picture to the right showing his great great granddaughter finally receiving his honorary med medical degree 170 years after he would have graduated and now you're a part of the current legacy which is the dr david k mcdonough scholarship this will help continue african americans and afro caribbeans to self-determine their dreams. And we wanna see the pipeline increase into ophthalmology and ENT. So as Dr. LaRoche said, and all of us will continue to say, please be generous, please donate. We know that healthcare is lacking the representation that's necessary to give the best treatment possible. And this is just another step in the direction of making that truism a, a reality where we can we can help really treat our patients to the best of our ability. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edgehill. Thank you for your leadership, Dr. Edgehill. We appreciate that. Okay, at this point, I wanna introduce Dr. Jacqueline Busingi with subspecialty training in uveitis. She's currently an associate professor of ophthalmology at the Albany Medical College and Chief of Ophthalmology at the Albany Stratton Veterans Affairs Hospital. And I will turn it over to her. Jackie will introduce the student with us tonight and we will see their presentation. Our first um, student to congratulate is Christian Akatoye um, for ophthalmology. He's a student at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, anticipated class of 2024. Of note, he was a summer intern via the Scholars of Ophthalmology program at Mass Eye and Ear and we'd love to hear about your research. Hello, thank you to NMA for this opportunity. My name is Christian Akatoye. I'm a fourth year medical student from Case Western, and I'm here to discuss my project looking at the long-term outcomes in diabetic macroedema patients that have a limited early response versus an early response to anti-death injections. Diabetic macroedema is one of the most common vision-threatening complications of diabetic retinopathy and occurs as a result of advanced end glycation products to disrupt the blood retinal barrier, thus allowing the accumulation of fluid within the retina. Currently, anti-death injections are the first line therapy and can be given on a four-week treatment regimen, an eight-week treatment regimen, and even beyond. Treatment response can be assessed anatomically with that variable such as the central central thickness, CST, or visually looking at the ETDRS letter testing. Considering that the burden of multiple injections that patients can accrue from having DME. It's very important for ophthalmologists to be able to assess how patients respond to anti-death injections and adjust the treatment regimen accordingly to prevent further vision loss. Thus, in our project, we wanted to look at what those long-term outcomes in patients that had a limited early response versus an early response, as well as also to determine if we can look at systemic comorbidities and other variables to determine whether we can predict which patients would have a limited early response and those that would have an early response. 
Our project differs from previous projects in the sense that we did this in real clinical practice versus other previous products that did this in the classic clinical trial where a lot of variables are tightly controlled and thus it's hard to tell whether those results would translate into the real world. We did a retrospective chart review at the Coli Institute where we took 112 patients between January of 2012 and June of 2022 and essentially broke them down based on a previous set criteria where those that had uh, an anatomic memory response had a less than 10% reduction in CST from the onset of injections to three months, and those that had a visual limited early response had a less than five ETDR slider gains from that same time point. Our results showed that about 71.4% of patients fit both criteria compared to 28.6%, um, and then when we looked at it just anatomically, it was about a 50-50 split, whereas uh, when you looked at from those that had a visual limited early response, it was about 60% compared to 40%. When looking at the box plots, you can see that a majority of the patients that had a, on average, those that had a limited early response tend to have a higher BCVA and a lower CST, which we think pays homage to the ceiling and floor effect, but those the patients that have a high BCVA at baseline have very little room for improvement. And the same can be said when looking at CST, whereas those that have a, need, a very low CST at baseline don't have much more room to improve with anti get injections. Thus, with this in mind, we corrected for these baseline differences using a linear regression. And we saw that from baseline, patients didn't have really much of a difference between the two groups anatomically and visually. But when we looked at it from three months, we saw that those that had a limited early response tend to be stable visually, whereas those that had an early response tend to lose those visual improvements that they made in the first few months. Anatomically, both groups saw improvement in CST, but those were, they were much more significant than those that had a limited early response, which we believe that these results may be due to the fact that those that had a limited early response may have had a more aggressive treatment regimen after the three months compared to those that had an early response. Thus, showing that anti vgf injections do in fact work and more injections can be beneficial. However, um, this is a speculation and more research would be needed to be done in order to assess this. Uh, another point, we did look at various variables to see if we could predict which patient would have a limited early response and an early response, but due to the fact that those results were insignificant, I didn't include this in the presentation. So thank you for your time. I'm very honored for this award. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Would you like to say a few words? Yes. Uh, thank you again, everyone on the committee, Dr. Roche, Dr. Echo, Dr. Bessinger, and thank you everyone that donated. Uh, as someone that is, has always wanted to be an ophthalmologist and has dreamed of it, it's very exciting and nerve-wracking to be so close to this goal and being awarded the Dr. Um, the Dr. David Kearney McDonough Award will really help with achieving this process and uh, this goal and, and so thankful. Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, our next Great job. Winner, Congrats. Our next winner is Maya Matabele for otolaryngology. She's the class of 2025 from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. She was a 2021 Wisconsin Medical uh, Alumni Association uh, full tuition scholarship recipient, which is amazing. And she's been a student researcher since 2021 in the Department of Otolaryngology. Hi, my name is Maya Matabele, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. I want to start by saying thank you for this opportunity and for your attention. Today I'll be presenting on the topic of perinatal airway obstruction and our research examining fetal goiter. I have nothing to disclose. Fetal goiter is a rare congenital disorder that can present with life-threatening airway obstruction at birth due to its position in the anterior neck. Many cases are identified on prenatal imaging. However, there are no guidelines or standardized strategies for delivery. Additionally, routine delivery presents a limited window of time for intervention. Pregnant persons with a diagnosis of fetal goiter may be candidates for delivery modifications, such as attended delivery, where an otolaryngologist or other airway expert is present on standby, or delivery on placental support, such as the ex utero intrapartum treatment procedure, wherein there is partial delivery through an elective C-section 
while utero-placental gas exchange is maintained for oxygenation, and this extends the, the amount of time or the window of time for intervention. Fetal goiter is one of the most common indications for exit. However, the exit procedure requires extensive personnel and resources and is not without maternal risk, including uterine atony and hemorrhage. Therefore, data to guide treatment selection are essential. While cases of exit procedures for this indication are, recorded, are reported in the literature, there are no systematic data regarding the frequency and type of airway intervention performed. The goal of our study was to compare the necessity and type of perinatal airway interventions between the general population and individuals with fetal goiter. To this aim, we utilized the Healthcare Costs and Utilization Project Kids and Patient Database to identify birth hospitalizations with a discharge diagnosis of goiter and those without from years 2000 to 2019. Those records were separated, and for each record, the following airway interventions on day of life 0 and 1 were examined. Additional data collected included patient demographics, complications, and hospital data. The patient population was 61% male, 55% white, and routine discharge occurred in 83% of cases. Airway intervention on day of life 0 and 1 was required in 16.9% of individuals with a birth hospitalization discharge diagnosis of goiter compared to 1.7% in neonates without goiter. This included endotracheal intubation in 16% of cases and a separate or paired laryngoscopy bronchoscopy in 1-5% to of cases. Less than 1% of patients required a tracheostomy, less than 1% of individuals underwent mass resection or decompression, and no patients required ECMO or CPR, and there were no morta mortalities. Overall, there was an increased incidence that was identified during our study period from 0.98 to 2.13, with an overall incidence of 1.08 per 100,000 during our study period. This may be overestimated due to the lack of standard thyroid assessment guidelines on routine fetal ultrasound. In summary, our study revealed a significantly higher airway intervention rate in these patients compared to the general population. However, this is much lower than that of other congenital neck masses such as teratomas. This suggests significant value in the pursuit of diagnostic-specific prognostication. Less than 1% of patients required a surgical airway or surgical resection, and the remainder were managed with endoscopic intervention alone. As a retrospective database review, our study is limited to the data points available in the HCUP database, and details on prenatal findings and workup are lacking. We're unable to link mom and baby's charts. And lastly, information about any delivery modifications to support airway intervention are lacking. In conclusion, individuals with fetal goiter require significantly higher rates of, of perinatal airway intervention. However, endoscopic intervention alone can avoid neurologic complications in 99% of cases. These data suggest a potential role for de-escalation in select goiter patients. Future directions for this project inc include applying the methodology to other etiologies of perinatal airway intervention and the creation of a prospective multi-institutional registry to capture specific elements of treatment of neonates with airway obstruction. And in doing so, we hope to create a protocol for, for physicians to help guide the decision-making process and importantly, provide guidance to pregnant persons when faced with the diagnosis of congenital airway obstruction. I would like to sincerely thank the National Medical Association, the NMA Ophthalmology Section, and the David Kearney McDonough Scholarship Committee for this opportunity. It is my dream to one day become an otolaryngologist. This scholarship and the support of NMA represent significant motivation for me to excel academically and bring me one step closer to the stream. Finally, I would like to thank Dr. David Kearney McDonough for his invaluable contributions to the fields of otolaryngology ophthalmology, and the betterment of medicine. It is truly an honor to present with you today, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Big congratulations to you, Maya. I don't know if you have anything else to add, because that was such a great presentation. I just want to, yeah, I mean, I cannot emphasize enough how much of an honor this is to be here with all of you, and thank you so much for this honor. I'm this is a really great um, opportunity, and I'm excited to continue to pursue otolaryngology. Um, and it's great to see all of you in, um, virtually. So thank you so much.
Congratulations. Although you're in the ophthalmology section, you're going to say <laughs> into, the, into the Harry Barnes Society, which is the ENT section of the NMA as well. So we'll get you plugged in with them. Excellent presentation, Maya. And our last but not least um, is Jeffrey Bawache, who is a class of 2024 at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. He has won a research supplement grant award from the National Institutes of Health uh, and National Eye Institute. If you could please tell us about your research. I would like to say thank you for the scholarship and also for the opportunity to present my work. My name is Jeff Rubarche and I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. I'll share with you some of my work that I did during my research year at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary using UVA light to create a mouse model for Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy. The corneal endothelium serves as a barrier between the cornea and the anterior chamber. As you can see here in the image on the right, the corneal endothelium is made up of a single layer of cells, and these cells contain sodium-potassium pumps, which transport water from the stroma to the anterior chamber. This helps maintain a reasonable corneal thickness. In childhood, we have about 4,000 corneal endothelial cells per square millimeter. These cells do not regenerate and they do decline with age. Damage to the corneal endothelial cells can lead to Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy. The gradual loss of corneal endothelial cells can lead to vision loss. Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy or FECD affects about 4% of the population over the age of 40 in the United States. Some of the risk factors include UVA light exposure, age greater than 40, female sex, smoking, and TCF4 trinucleotide repeat. Corneal transplant is currently the only treatment option. There are no medical treatments, and that's because the mechanism underlying the disease is poorly understood. This brings us to an urgent need to create a model to study the mechanisms underlying FECD in order to develop medical therapeutics. In our FECD mouse model, we expose our mice cornea to UVA light, usually in the right eye, and we use the left eye as control. As you can see in the fluorescent stain below, the UVA exposure induces cornea injury at 24 hours post-exposure. This cornea injury usually improves at the one week and two week time point. The transient cornea injury is an indication of a successful UVA irradiation. One of the diagnostic measures of FECD is increased corneal thickness. On the left, we have OCT images of our mice cornea, and on the right is a quantification of these images. We use two mice strains to increase the statistical power of our study, ATM wild-type mice and ATM knockout mice. If you take a look at our OCT images on the left, you can tell that one day after UVA exposure, there is increased corneal thickness in both the ATM wild type and the ATM knockout strains compared to pre-UVA exposure. And this swelling continues even at the one week time point in both strains. On the right, looking at our quantification here, white and black are the two different mice strains that we have. At baseline, mice cornea is about 100 microns thick, and you can tell that at one day post UVA exposure in both strains, there is almost a twofold increase, and the mice cornea thickness is around 200 microns. This increase is sustained even into the one week time point. Another important diagnostic measure of FECD is cornea endothelial cell counts. On the left, we have HRT images of the corneal endothelium in both our ATM wild type and ATM knockout mice. On the right, we have a quantification of the corneal endothelial cell counts of these images. Looking at the HRT images in the pre-UVA, you can tell that the corneal endothelium in both of these strains do have the normal hexagonal shape, and they also have the normal regular 
arrangements and the normal morphology. Compared to the one week time point in both of these strains, we can tell that the cells begin to lose their hexagonal shape and they are also disorganized after the UVA exposure. And this disorganization and abnormal morphology continues even at the two week time point. On the right, again, white and black are the two different mice strains that we have. You can tell that before UVA treatment here, normal corneal endothelium in mice is around 2,500 cells per millimeter squared. And with UVA exposure at one week and two weeks, we can see that there is a significant decrease in the corneal endothelial cell count to about 1,000 corneal endothelial cells per millimeter squared. In conclusion, we're able to create using UVA light an animal model which has increased corneal thickness, decreased corneal endothelial cell counts, and abnormal cellular morphology, and these are all characteristics of fused corneal endothelial dystrophy. Having a mouse model has helped us to begin to understand some of the mechanistic pathways for the, path for the pathogenesis of FECD. I shared with you some of the preliminary work that we did, but we know that UVA light exposure induces DNA damage, which leads to fugues endothelial corneal dystrophy. Some of the subsequent work that we did was looking at the role of ATM, which is a DNA damage response protein. And we've been able to identify that this ATM protein induces FECD through cell cycle re-entry and senescence. Additionally, we've done some preliminary studies to show in vitro that we can decrease ATM expression using ATM inhibitors. With that, we know that targeting ATM with novel inhibitors may be promising as a therapeutic strategy in FECD. I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Ula Jakunas, the Jakunas lab and the clinical team for their guidance and support in making this work possible. I would also like to thank the Dr. David Kearney McDonald Scholarship Committee. I am very grateful for this award. Congratulations, Jeffrey. Um, would you like to say anything to our participants today? Yes, thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to meet everyone um, virtually. I am truly honored and humbled to have been selected um, as a 2023 recipient of the Dr. David Kearney McDonald Scholarship. Um, learning more about Dr. David McDonald's life um, from Dr. Erjo today has been truly inspiring and it serves as a tremendous source of encouragement and motivation for me. I would like to thank the founding members again and the committee members as well for this important award and for getting me a step closer to my dream of becoming an ophthalmologist. Thank you. Congratulations, Jeffrey. Are you from Ghana, Jeffrey? I am from Ghana, yes. Some of my Ghanaian colleagues were very excited when I think two out of the three winners are from Ghana. Oh. And are you interested in going into cornea? I am interested in going into cornea, yes. Okay, there's a big need in Ghana and throughout Africa for corneal transplant tissue, eye bank development. So there's, there's a huge opportunity there as you, you know, think about your future goals, you know? Yes. All right, congratulations. The world needs you, Jeffrey. Thank you. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you and congratulations. Dr. LaRoche, back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline, excellent. So. This is the um, scholarship award that the students are going to get. Uh, this is Christian's award, 23. Let's go to the next slide, please. And Maya's award here. You're going to get a nice, beautiful certificate in the mail and Jeffrey's award certificate. They're each going to get $5,000 as well as a travel grant scholarship to help them with their research, their travel, and things of that nature. So, congratulations to all the student winners. Can you go to the next slide, please? So please be generous, please donate, please invite someone to next year's event. Please invite industry, corporate sponsors, business and corporate sponsors. I'd like to eventually include a lot more corporations that are supporting this event to expand these scholarships. Students can graduate with as much as $200,000 of debt. Um, 
There's no reason why we can't give tens of thousands of dollars to students to help support them. And we will continue to try to grow these scholarships, develop a foundation. Uh, as we move forward, we're gonna reach back. Uh, click on the QR code. You can click to make a donation. Next slide, please. Now, I do wanna say one thing. Right now, we are in a war. You see it on the news every day, the Israeli-Palestinian war. And I do wanna provide an African perspective on this war, okay? Africans around the world denounce terrorism, occupation, dehumanization, Western and Arab left land theft, colonization, jihadism, and racism. Africans recommend a peaceful mode of life with diplomacy and living in harmony, truth, justice, balance, order, righteousness, and morality. Africans must continue to support these principles and live by example by supporting and building stronger communities in balance with nature. We must also arm ourselves to protect and enforce this peaceful mode of living. Next slide, please. At the NMA, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Your contributions are tax deductible and supports a diverse future of ophthalmology and ENT with excellence to help address healthcare disparities. You can mail checks to the National Medical Association care of David Kearney McDonough Scholarship Travel Grant, 8403 Colesville Road, Suite 820, Silver Spring, Maryland. Thank you. We will see you next year. This is my email address if you need to reach out to me for anything to get more information. And can we just show the one slide again to make donations? Do you have the slide to make the donations, Sean? That same slide with the QR code? Yes. We're going to end with this slide. This is where you can make your checks payable. Uh, scan the QR code once again. And this will conclude our tribute for 2023 for Dr. David Kearney McDonough. We have the NMA National Convention that's going to be in uh, end of July, early August in New York City. And we have the Pan-African Glaucoma Congress that's going to be in Ghana at the end of June. Congratulations to everybody. Let's all wave everybody good night. Congratulations to all the recipients. And everybody, Congratulations, everyone. You all Thank have a good you. night and continue to march on. And we're here to help you uh, as you go along, okay? Congratulations, Dr. LaRoche. Thank you all. You're welcome. Thank Have you all. Time. Thank you.